Hey guys, so we talked about over the last few days, quite a few things. We talked about the legal system. Uh, we talked about in particular, Edward Snowden and his revelation to the American people about not only American technological capabilities, but the fact that those, that, that expertise was being used in violation of their constitutional privacy. And as a result of that revelation, of that whistleblowing, the trust between the people and the government has diminished severely. And that response has created excessive marketing in order to highlight the advantages of the American society and of American culture, particularly diversity. You know, it's not an accident that we had at the same time these disclosures were being made. They were being made under the first African-American president in American history. So, of course, there's this idea that there may be intelligence and counterintelligence operating in silos, not knowing what the other is really doing, despite the fact that there's supposed to be checks and balances on each other. But that trust could have been repaired within the country since the revelations from, from about three years ago, or four years ago, I should say. None of that has actually happened. And what has actually happened is that a foreign country, a foreign, a foreign amalgam, amalgamation of countries in Europe called the EU, the European Union, has been the one that has been coming up with the most creative ideas on how to keep technology and privacy as balanced as possible while maintaining security. And you can see that in many ways. We talked about the law, we talked about how lawyers have failed the country. To give you an idea, a lot of the people that are being marketed to the American people as presenting change and progress are for the most part merely copying ideas from the European Union, both on a local and a national level. I'll just give you a couple of quick, quick examples. Scotland passed a law that uh, allowed free or complimentary sanitary products for women. I'm sure that was for women below a, an income threshold. And my city passed something similar. Never mind the fact that you probably you know, want to try to fix a welfare system that isn't providing enough income or enough subsidies for these necessary items. Never mind that you want to fix that problem at the stores. Remember what we talked about, that one of the reasons empires decline is because they don't go back and fix problems. They maintain the existing structures, the existing crumbling pillars and they try to add another pillar next to it to maintain it. While preserving, of course, the very legitimate need to maintain jobs and to maintain other political power groups that are supporting the status quo. Because you don't want to be in a situation where the status quo is changed overnight. That's called a revolution. And ironically, what happens when you don't Remember, when you don't merge those pillars into something cohesive over time, when you don't have enough glue within your societies, organizations, and institutions to allow that pillar to eventually crumble and be replaced by a superior system while protecting the people who have debt and other obligations and other expertise within the old system. If you don't do that, then you end up in a position where revolution becomes more and more likely. In other words, if you, revolution would be ant the antithesis of an incremental change in progress. It would be something that happens overnight. We talked about all these things, but what we didn't talk about was the fact that Snowden, the whistleblower, who was working for the NSA, the top intelligence agency in the United States, we didn't talk about the fact that 
he was a low-level worker, so he only had access to a small trove of information. And what's really happened over time is that technology has outpaced wisdom. It's something that philosophers and artists have been warning us about for uh, as long as you can probably remember, as, as, as long as human history has been in, has been in, in existence. And one of, the, one of the things that we can talk about that isn't as well known is the extent of capacity for VR, virtual reality. So we know that we have the capacity to put people's, you know, for, well, first of all, broadcasters are given earpieces. If you look on television, uh, they're given earpieces to tell them when their time is up, when it's time to go to commercial. And that's, the, you know, you can imagine that if you can put an earpiece uh, in someone's ear that's not being picked up by the mic uh, that emits a simple beeping sound. You can also imagine that you can create a society where a lot of the people involved uh, are not only given beeping sounds to signal a change in television, uh, but also information, words, and so on. With virtual reality, you can also imagine a situation where that capacity is taken to the next level. Where, if you understand virtual realities, it's the idea that you can create an avatar, an extension of yourself, and put yourself and your voice in that avatar. It's not too far-fetched to imagine that we're already in a position where you can, where somebody working for the foreign intelligence agency or a private security company can insert his or her voice in someone else. And in, in doing so, create what some people might consider to be a more, a safer way of gathering data, especially overseas. And before we go further, we can talk about what intelligence agencies are supposed to do. Uh, they're supposed to gather information and gather data, and also to promote that data to the general public in, in order to create a better society, and also to elevate good people and diminish bad people. If you had to describe intelligence work in a short fifth grade, childish way, simple way that, would, that a child would understand, that would be it. So every technological innovation is simply the, especially in modern human history, has been designed to gather data for precisely this goal. With VR, you know, we're not, we're, we're not yet at a, at a point in time where you can, you know, you can imagine some problems with this VR capacity. One of which is that your voice doesn't change. We're not in a, in a, in an environment where you can put your voice in multiple people without being noticed. Especially not now that mobile phones have microphones. You're not yet in a position where you can conceal your activity overseas in order to conceal your by inserting yourself into multiple people overseas. And remember, this is a significant advantage in, in gathering intelligence is that it's being able to put your voice in someone else through virtual reality simply because there's no way to gather intelligence in an independent way if you have to memorize or, or become fluent in a hundred different dialects or even multiple languages. We talked about this before, how we have all this technology, but we haven't really talked about, we haven't really talked about this idea that the cultural institutions have yet to catch up. And one of the, one of the problems has been that some, well, translations have been a massive problem. And the pessimist in me thinks that that might've been deliberate because, you, you know, if you, if you mistranslate something that an enemy says, and you mis not only mistranslate, but if you mischaracterize it, you can present this idea, this image of your country being superior somehow. And of course you can make the other side look bad. And, but setting, going back to what we were talking about, so, so one of the problems has been that, you know, we're not yet at a point in time when you can immediately modulate your voice in a way that also is compatible with inserting yourself in a virtual reality environment 
within another person in a physical environment. And we're not yet there, we probably will be there. And one of the reasons I'm making these, these, these videos is because we're now at an interim period where you can identify these issues. We're going to get to the po a point in time where all these issues will eventually be worked out and therefore will be invisible or indistinguishable to the human ear and the human eye. But, that's one of, but that VR capacity is not something that Snowden discussed. And it's important because it's, it's really, it really is essential if you, have an, if you have intelligence agencies, especially within the US, going all over the world without, without properly, not just all over the world, but within the same country. You know, we have these people going around the world, but without properly vetting their weakness in terms of having their voices recognized. And so that of course allows competing agencies to pick up on who these people are and then immediately target them, which can be done in multiple ways. People tend to assume that when you identify uh, an intelligence agent or an asset, that the first step is to <laughs> neutral neutralize that person. That's not actually true. What you want to do is you want to give that person false information. So, uh, and then to have that person deliver false information back to his or her handler. That, by the way, is the same way that you deal with hacking attacks, is you overload the system with, with false information. And then you highlight the false information that you've, you've deliberately put in there in order to weaken the credibility of whoever it is that managed to hack into your system. So the movies and the media have been remiss in explaining what intelligence assets, well, in, in explaining the strategy of not only gathering data, but also what you do when you discover someone else gathering data in a way that's covert. So we talked about that, about the, the usefulness of having a system that allows you to, to attract one or two people from overseas who speaks the language fluently in that province. So you're trying, so just imagine, you're trying to get information about a province. We can make it really simple. We're in the, we're in the US. Let's say you want to get information about somebody in Mississippi. Not just somebody, but an environment in Mississippi. You can't just go there yourself, right? If you're from a Boston school, but if you can recruit somebody from Mississippi, and put them into your organization and then use virtual reality in order to put that person's voice in that environment, suddenly, and suddenly you're not only protecting the asset that you've recruited, you know, you're also in a position where you can blend in. Because remember, you've got the same voice as someone else. And you haven't needed to infiltrate physically because you're already in a position where you've, you've, you've done the recruitment ahead of time, or it's already done. So, when you put all these things together, and you understand the utility, you also understand why it's being done. You know, the idea of having, you know, post 9-11 in this country, we had this idea that the CIA, which was a smaller organization, a much smaller organization than the NSA, we had this idea that we would recruit people to learn Arabic. You can only imagine, but remember that if we haven't already done a good job teaching people Arabic or understanding Arabic to English translations, that recruiting people within the US, even if they are from, you know, Arab countries, is going to be difficult. You might get a Syrian that speaks a different, speaks differently, not just accent, but dialect, than in somebody in Iraq. And so you might, if you, if you, if you, have a, if you have difficulty in recruiting enough people, especially people who are loyal, who believe in your cause, you can only imagine the kind of problems you can get because of expediency, because of the need to show results, because of the need to gather information quickly, especially in an environment where you believe that there might be another imminent attack coming from that foreign location. So there's all, the first thing we want to talk about as a result of this information is that credibility matters and that credibility is something that is used and abused and that is as advanced 
either the elevation of credibility in a, in a person or the destruction of credibility in a person. That, those methods are as advanced as data gathering. So, the question now is that now that we've moved on to a digital environment that can be manipulated, the question now is how to attach the physical environment to it. That's what VR is. We're getting there. You know, even, even we talked about earpieces and broadcasters. We talked about the ability to, to insert your voice in someone else. Uh, we talked about all these things, but you know, if you think about even movements, movements are electrical charges, right? Your muscles move in part based on and, and the body sending signals to those muscles. So you can only imagine that we're probably at a point in time where we can have a nano chip that you can insert in somebody else's body uh, that then even uh, that, that is even able to manipulate them physically. So this is useful uh, if you have someone who's paralyzed. This is fantastic. But every scientific innovation is eventually or inevitably co-opted by the military in order to give them an advantage. That's something else that we weren't taught adequately in school. Now, let's give a couple of examples that I've seen myself. And let's start simple. If you go to a casino, you know, we've heard all this. We all have all these movies about counting cards. Let's take a roulette machine. Let's, and the roulette machine is basically a plastic ball or, you know, some other kind of material that bounces around a wheel. And at that point in time is, if it lands on black or red, you know, gives you money or causes you to lose money. I've been in casinos where the ball was able to jump a little bit after, a little bit, you know, in a way that didn't make sense. So the, so I would put money or, you know, or, or a whale would be putting money somewhere and then you have a, a situation where either, either you want that person to lose money or win money. The ball made an extra jump. It was something you really had to look at because remember, as you're trying to manipulate the digital environment with the physical and, and combine it with the physical environment, you still have to obey the laws of physics. There's always, there's still some kind of limit, at least today. And eventually there won't be that limit. That's why I'm trying to, to, to give that information today. And so we're in that environment where you can, in a casino, just make that ball bounce extra. And in doing so, cause someone you like or dislike to win or lose money. Now that's something that is a very simple thing and I've seen it myself. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where it's not as noticeable, at least not to the human eye. So that's a simple idea and you can think about why somebody would be in that position, right? Let's say you're in private security, someone comes in and says, this person is, is hostile to the country in some way. And you can then, you know, instead of having to you know, go out and put fire hoses on this person and his or her family, instead of having to deal with protesters, what you're really doing, which is another strategy that is not discussed as, as, as often, is you're trying to bankrupt that person in order to not only diminish that person's, person's credibility, but you're trying to bankrupt that person so the person doesn't have as many options to gather information. But you can also see how in every digital environment or in a, and in every physical environment, you still have to rely on credibility. You still have to rely on the credibility of that information. So if you're told that person is in, that, in a position where he or she is pursuing goals that are inimical to your country, in some years, that person might be Nelson Mandela, who was once classified as a terrorist by the United States and other countries in order to presumably maintain shipping routes in, across Africa. And South Africa is, is, I assume, the most affluent country in, uh, in Africa, in part because of the United States taking over that port, which then can link to ports in Asia and provide a safe passage through. And in doing so, maintain the superiority of trade and wealth back to the empire in the West since 1511. So that's one easy example. Let's take it, let's take it to, the, to another level, hypothetically. 
um, you can you can also envision a, a scenario where let's take someone one of my heroes Muhammad Ali who obviously has significant talent on his own you can imagine a scenario where you put uh, something in again very basic technology because this is quite some time ago where you put a magnet of some sort in his back tooth small one doesn't or even in his front tooth and in, again <laughs> Everything once discovered eventually becomes smaller. So you put something, you try to remove the toxin, you know, and, and you've got to remember something. You know, he has Alzheimer's, right? Is it really because he was hit or is it because he, he's been suffering from toxic materials within his body that were designed to give him an advantage? So it's possible, and I have no evidence establishing this, but you can look up the fact that his trainer, Angelo Dundee, was an FBI informant. That's a fact, it's public, public information. You can ima imagine a scenario where an already fast, unhittable Muhammad Ali was assisted by law enforcement using very rudimentary technology, putting a magnet in somewhere in his body, somewhere on his face, and then infiltrating or paying off the person in the other corner and at that point, putting something of the same charge, a magnet, a magnet of the same charge, in that person's glove. So let's say you believe that Sonny Liston is working for the mob, and every time he wins, the mob wins money. And you want to bankrupt the mafia. You elevate someone like Muhammad Ali, who's already talented. You infiltrate Sonny Liston's corner, his training room, you manage to switch the gloves, well, you don't even have to switch them, right? You can just have somebody put something in there in between different compartments. And suddenly you have Muhammad Ali gaining a split second advantage whenever a fist comes close to his face. He, and he's able to move away from that fist in a way that seems magical or superhuman. And in doing so, he's able to assist in wiping out the mafia. And remember that Muhammad Ali was supported by the police, he was supported by law enforcement in Louisville. He was not only was supported by law enforcement, he was supported by the lawyers, distinguished lawyers within that city. And he was able to go to the Supreme Court. And as a result of his influence, he was able to turn the country partly against Vietnam and show the world that this is something that is not working out in the same way as we're being told in the United States. That's another example of what could be the case. We can, well now we're quite advanced now, right? We're decades later. We're now in a digital environment that has to be manipulated. Let me give you another example that I've, this, is, this one is one I've seen or I've experienced. You can go online, everything is digital. And as long as you have an identifier, you can put that identifier uh, and link it within the system that is linked to some, to some code, computer programming code that presents that digital, env digital environment either in a way that prevents that person from getting information or it gives that person information. The most, the easiest thing to imagine would be the example I'm, I'm about to give you, or one of the easiest examples. You know, I, I go online and I see a hotel in, in Nevada, a state next to nearby California, and I see a situation where the price is higher than one that I've seen in, on another website or, or on my mobile phone. And so I call and I say, you know, I've logged into the system and I'm, I'm looking at your price and the price here isn't really, you know, <laughs> it's a, you know it's, it's, I'd like to negotiate, right? I, I want the price that I'm looking at in the other app on my mobile, mobile phone. Can you do that for me? And she looks at it and says, yeah, we have a policy of matching prices. Um, as long as those prices are legitimate, she, she looks up the price and then she asks me to go back well, she tries to charge me a $10 phone fee, which I, I reject uh, by arguing that, well, you know, if you add that fee, it's not as low 
as the price that you're giving me. So go, please go ahead and waive that fee so we can comply with the policy. And I go back and I see the price on the website that now matches a completely different application's price on my mobile phone. And she's able to do that because she asks me for my email. You know, what's, what's your email? She, then she's able to go into the system and manipulate that digital data to give me a price that is lower than what someone else receives. You can imagine if an intelligence agency's goals are partly to elevate good people and bad people, and the, and the way that you try to elevate good people is by make, giving them money and therefore more access. And one of the ways you try to diminish bad people is by making them bankrupt. That's the Singapore method, by the way. You can imagine through, through, through litigation. You can, you can imagine that you can have a lot of issues over time if that credibility of information is incorrect. And remember that Nelson Mandela, who is now considered to be a hero and a freedom fighter, remember that he was once considered to be a terrorist. It's not just Nelson Mandela. You can look at Osama bin Laden, who was the perpetrator of the 9-11 attacks on the United States and New York. If you look at newspapers, Osama bin Laden was, was called a freedom fighter by British newspapers. When he was paid, or, or at least funded indirectly by the United States, in order to take down the Soviet Union. And they succeeded. And you can argue that Al-Qaeda and a lot of other organizations sprouted from the Mujahideen that was funded in part by the United States. And there were interviews, this is all public information. There were newspapers that called Osama bin Laden a freedom fighter. There are military generals that were interviewed, that were told, that told the French newspapers or French magazines which is more important in human history, the fall or the collapse of the Soviet Union or a bunch of, you know, <laughs> or a bunch of Taliban in Afghanistan? That's, I'm paraphrasing, but that's as close to the direct quote as I can give you. It was by a general with a Polish name, I believe it's uh, Brzezinski. Again, public information, but whether or not you're able to see it, I'm not sure because once again, if you have that control over a digital, digital environment, you can prevent people from seeing things and you can have, and you can assist people in seeing things. And that also explains the rise of social media. If you can, through advertising dollars, have one group of people see one bit of information and another group of people not see the same information, you can mold public opinion. And the rise of the influencer class, remember, has been assisted by the intelligence agencies. Remember that it's not enough to get information. You have to influence society. You have to get that information out to the public. You can't just get that information because if you do, and you either sit on it or you try to operate covertly with it at all times, all you're really doing is creating an elite class that is distanced from the people in a way that's not conducive to social cohesion. So a proper situation, a proper situation, if you have an intelligent intelligence agency. A proper situation is where they get that information, they try to create progress over time by creating a system that replaces a pillar that is becoming broken and maintaining the sturdiness of the structure. You can again imagine how difficult that is if you are in a position where you're either following orders or your leadership changes every four years or since Vietnam we're in a position where our moral compass has gone astray, which was then exacerbated by the 9-11 attacks, which resulted in unaccountable funding going into multiple organizations, including intelligence agencies, that were probably not used in ways that made sense and that improved overall outcomes for the United States or for its allies. We know this because of all the mistakes that were made in the past. And, and what we don't really understand yet is that a lot of that information was a result of poor intelligence. There was a joke that my, one of my high school professors said in class. He, says that, he said that military intelligence is an oxymoron. In other words, it's contradictory. And this is somebody that fought in Vietnam. 
or allegedly fought in Vietnam, his demeanor and looking back on it is similar to an intelligence asset. The way that he speaks, you know, once you have a training program, you can start to pick up patterns as well. And the information that he had and so on and so forth. It could be a counterintelligence program and so on. So you've got this one problem again where you have all these strategies on how to elevate good people and bad people using data gathering techniques. But you still don't have a, you still have a credibility problem, especially in this country since Vietnam. Didn't stop. And here we are, 60 years later, or more than that. It doesn't seem as if, as if there's a U-turn in sight. Now, we've given a few examples. This also explains social media now, because, if you, because of, of the fact that you have to get that message out to the people, whatever it is, you will have to create a situation where you are, and you attach yourself to people with many followers, to people whose eyeballs, who have access to eyeballs. Now, it used to be that the television did that, did that for you, so you could infiltrate and or elevate, using various techniques, different broadcasters. And the intelligence agencies did a pretty good job of that. Dan Rather, boy, they just, they just did a great job in the old days. You had a, you had a, a definite counterintelligence situation where the people were being notified of what the government was doing. Even if it wasn't obvious, you had a lot of journalism in this country that was legitimate. But not only that then made its way into Congress, congressional committees, like the Church Committee. But and this tells you that that is not the only problem because the Church Committee was quite, a, quite some time ago and it didn't seem to do much in terms of stopping the surveillance state and surveillance capitalism. But with respect to influencers, you can see why there's been a degradation, degradation of content. Because if the goal is to get influencers who then, on a part-time basis, espouse some sort of philosophy, political philosophy, or social philosophy, to get those followers, you know, one of the strategies is obviously, you know, it can obviously be based on superficial behavior, on outlandish behavior, and so on and so forth. That, that explains why so many people within the U.S. That explains why there's been such a decline in journalism over time. Because if you can get more eyeballs with someone in category A, simply because he or she is beautiful, it's going to be a, you, know, you have to focus on that person in order to get in order to get your message out. If you focus on the nerds and the geeks who are losing eyeballs over time as the medium changes from the written word onto television and, the, and, and visual media, you start to lose credibility and influence because you're not where the game is. You're not where the game is being played. So when you look back on the United States and the decline of the United States, you can see that the rise of social media is in part an, an attempt to maintain influence. In order, to, But the influence because of the excessive competition has become harder to maintain for the establishment. Now, that's, we are now in a position where we're trying to change that through podcasts. So we are trying to change a scenario where the visual has completely overwhelmed the logical. And podcasts are one way of doing it. Now that doesn't necessarily help someone like me who's hearing impaired and who can read very quickly to the point where listening to a podcast becomes an, ex an excruciating exercise in patience that I, that I don't have. But that's a, it's a sign that counterintelligence is not completely dead, that their funding is still intact and they're trying to make a difference. So we put all these things together. There's a lot of information that I've given you, but the idea overall is that credibility is the most important aspect, not data gathering. And that credibility is, can be manipulated, ma ma you know, manipulated in many ways. Uh, we talked about bankruptcy. We talked about fines. Um, you know, this, this idea that the, the intelligence agencies run around assassinating each other in foreign countries is really not, not the case for the most part. We talked about multiple methods. Uh, we talked about the fact that law enforcement 
used to be heavily involved in countering the mafia using sports figures and that legacy continues today but that's of course a difficult legacy remember if you can manipulate that roulette ball in a casino imagine what you can do with a basketball and a hoop using missile technology imagine what you can do if you are told that so and so is a good person when in fact he's associated with the mafia and he makes a million dollar bet remember that it's not as if that money goes to all of it goes to an, an, an individual that money goes to an individual who is surrounded by you know you can call them sycophants you can call them just groupies but that money is surrounded by all these little mini economies that are seeking to replace a broken pillar somewhere so boxing we'll go back to muhammad ali boxing used to be a terrible place with a lot of injuries uh, for participants, death. And you know what happened was one of the reasons for that was because the mafia uh, was involved. It was making money off this. It didn't necessarily put the, the interests of its people first and foremost because it wasn't looking to do anything other than make money. And the idea of governments, right, is that, of course, you have to make money to survive and to get your message out. But the idea is that there's a higher purpose, and that's what differentiates the government and governmental propaganda from the mafia and mafia interests. So at the end of the day, right, so you have in boxing a success. You have a situation where by, it does appear that the intelligence agencies and the FBI wiped out the mafia and wiped out that source of funding. And if you look at gambling in general, right, the hub of that is in Nevada. Well, how did, how did all those casinos come into, come into existence? Well, they came into existence, right, based on what well, was all mafia money, right? It was, just became legitimate. It became laundered in a way that benefited everybody. Because once you le le legitimize that influence that's gained over time, rather than wiping it out, you're forcing that group that was formerly behind the scenes, outside of the formal structures, you're forcing that group to comply with a host of just a host of different regulations that are designed to maintain a level playing field and again you look at boxing that happens in boxing the fbi wiped out the mafia for the most part in boxing using muhammad ali and at the end of the day right that's really what we've sort of gone backwards right because we haven't quite discovered a test for determining determining credibility and we're still using the old tricks in order to wipe out enemies without first trying to figure out if our techniques have a sound basis behind them. And it's not just bankruptcy, right? There are so many other ways of, of creating these sorts of, you know, uh, of uh, creating these sorts of diminishing of, uh, of people. Um, relationships, you know, lots of other ways. We haven't quite progressed past any of that. And so as a result, when you think about why the bad guys seem to, seem to be winning, when you think about that, it's not a coincidence. If you look at what's happened over time is that a lot of the bad guys have become incorporated into the legitimate economy, but it's not as if everyone in those organizations, whether it's Sinn Féin or whether it's the shareholders, controlling shareholders of MGM or any other casinos, within Las Vegas. It's not as if all of them went completely legitimate. They all were able to come, come into power in part because they had their own private security, which was exempt from, you know, a lot of the regulations that they were supposed to comply with. And remember that because there, there was often far more money within illegal activity than legal activity, remember that the technology is also different. And so, <laughs> A lot of the economy, once you start moving into a debt-based society, a lot of the economy is suddenly, suddenly revolves around paying off that debt in order to maintain your access to the eyeballs and your access to influence. And so what you've seen over time is that despite trying to legitimize everyone from the mafia to Sinn Féin, because of the original techniques, because human nature has not changed, we haven't made much progress. All we've done is give a conduit for the bad guys to take over and infiltrate and corrupt 
the legitimate institutions that they were that were supposed to rein them in. The easy, you, can, you can easily imagine this situation with the police department, right? You've got a, an underfunded police department somewhere, and you know it's not able to. It, it's told that private security will take over, and they're going to recruit uh, a few of the officers and pay them to patrol an area. Uh, and you, you can easily imagine how that that workout, that arrangement can be manipulated, right? You put the cops in an area uh, where, where there's legitimate business. And in doing so, comply with whatever whatever regulation was passed to promote formal economic activity, and then do all of your activity on on the other side of the building or somewhere else, because you now control the eyeballs of the police force while giving the appearance of legi of, le of legi legitimate behavior. Um, so when you look at human society today, and, and, and you know you look at the fact that the bad guys have won. That's something that's, you know, almost incontrover incontrovertible. And a lot of these, you know, you look at the rise in drugs and so on and so forth, that's linked to globalization, that's linked to, lack of, that to, to a lack of cooperation between different countries, which then inhibits the ability of legitimate institutions to control illegal behavior. You look at the fact that since human nature hasn't changed, you know, the activities of the quote-unquote bad guys the economic activity, all that money, it hasn't changed at all. In, in, in part because whatever allowed them to, to exist in the first place, whether it's drugs, uh, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of that over time, you know, gambling, you know, none of that's actually changed. And people like me say, well, you need to le 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 legalize these sorts of things in order to prevent this constant replacement of crumbling pillars. And at the, and at the same time, you know, we've got to create a situation where economic activity promotes a way of life that can compete legitimately with whatever it is that these other institutions, these, these informal actors are promoting. And we've tried that. You notice we keep trying these things, right? We've tried to legalize marijuana uh, we're trying to do this incrementally. So again, there is some hope because it's, we're trying to get there. But once again, you know, you, you really have to have context. And remember that the idea of governments is to provide context so that people can make progress, not just financially, but intellectually. And what's really happened over time is that you've got to control the money. Remember that you can elevate institutions, not just people, by not auditing them properly and, and allowing them to become a mass great wealth that then allows them to essentially, essentially buy off police departments, which then allows them to buy off politicians. And so what you see now on the, on the legitimate side of the equation within the U.S., you see this idea that the military since, since 2001 has essentially had unaccountable spending and hasn't done a good job countering the illegal outflows or the or the inimical outflows from that funding and this isn't something that's changed that much you look at justice douglas uh he talked about the fact that with military spending he talked about the fact that, that almost all of it goes to about four companies four defense contractors so a very concentrated situation and then you realize how is it that we've created this monopoly these trillion dollar corporations these amazons uh these you know, Google's, these apples, how is it that we've managed to create this concentration of technological wealth? That goes back to the failure to fix that concentrated spending since Vietnam. That goes back to the failure to heed President Eisenhower's warning about the military industrial complex 70 years ago. And we've been failing continuously since then. And when you study this time period, period in history, you're gonna realize the bad guys won. And people like me, we kept trying, we, we weren't arguing that this concentration of wealth was ipso facto, something dangerous to society. Because you can imagine a, a billionaire that has good ideas and is able to implement those ideas using his assets or her assets. The problem is when you have this concentration of wealth within an environment that was the purportedly start to diminish criminal activity and failed, and rather than diminish criminal activity, merely gave the criminals a seat at the table 
that they were then influenced, that, that, that they then used to take over the entire forum. Over time, you can see why we're here, why the bad guys have won, and why, in some cases, people think the bad guys are actually the good guys. Because they're the ones that are at least honest about what they're doing. They're not trying to operate behind the scenes. They're using the same technology. They have access to the same technology. Remember that the rise of private security is in part based on the fact that all this technology, this data gathering technology has been made smaller and therefore transportable <laughs> uh, to private contractors. And so a lot of private security companies are now equivalent to the NSA or to other organizations. And so what, what ends up happening is the, the, legitimate, the legitimate institutions are at a loss, are at a disadvantage because they now have to recruit against the mafia, which, you know, which means they have to use the legal system in a way that targets people. And when you do it that way, you realize that it's losing, you're on the losing side, right? <laughs> Somebody else manages to get X, Y, and Z because they're subject to different regulations if, even if they're not subject to different regulations, uh, they manage to evade them through the presence of private security or co-opting police departments. And you wake up one day and there are, no, there are no Muhammad Ali's anymore because the mafia is now on both sides of the transaction. Is it both in Sonny Liston's corner and in Muhammad Ali's corner because you've allowed a situation where the money has been running around amok without much accountability. And now you're in a position where there's so much debt that it's very difficult to figure out where to go from here. Because now with all that debt, that crumbling pillar that's maintaining all these structures that were supposed to be replaced by some sort of, by some progress, by a stronger pillar, you're realizing that that crumbling pillar now has, it's gonna cost a trillion dollars to, to demolish. And the new one is gonna cost much less. But what do you do? And if it's gonna cost a trillion dollars then what, what really happens in society is you end up building a new pillar for $200 million. You know, I'm just giving, throwing out numbers here. And you keep building all those pillars and eventually you have segregation. And eventually you have balkanization. And at that point, you have a society in disarray. You don't have what society was supposed to do, which is to maximize human, human potential. You have a lot of storytellers. And eventually, because you have a society that's split between people who think that God is creating all these sorts of um, miracles uh, and people who understand that technology is now advanced to the point where combined with surveillance capacity can replace the existence of God, but one that lacks true omniscience. And um, you know, you've got omnipotence, but not wisdom. And in that kind of a, kind of a scenario, you've got a rise in religious fanaticism because of, uh, first of all, because of the fact that you don't have taxation on an even level. You've got a split in society between, again, people who understand what's going on and people who don't understand what's going on. And, and you start to realize that your senses are being titillated in a way that doesn't replace the mafia, that doesn't take down Sonny Liston, but simply creates an environment where everyone tries to benefit because that pillar that Sonny Liston belongs to it's going to cost a trillion dollars to wipe out, so you might as well just give them a few seat at the table and then try to generate income in a way that maintains the overall structure. And that's where we are today.